I believe that the one of the answers to inflation is you spend money on capital. Doing housing in the LA basin is not so great because of rent control and because of the, you know, the high basis we have to buy in. When we're looking locally, we're like, well, what can we do here that's a, a compelling enough investment where we can structure away some of the risk but still have something that has a lot of demand. This is Maestro Minute the show that discusses all things real estate, sharing interviews with the most successful people in the industry. Hear from their perspective and what they are doing to achieve success. Get exclusive tips on how you can also succeed in real estate. Maestro Minute is brought to you by Maestro Development. Here's your host, Nareg Muradian. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Maestro Minute. As the intro said, I'm your host, Nareg Muradian. Today we're coming live from a great cigar local spot that we like to visit, have some good conversations here, uh, have some great meetings. Today, super excited. We have Mark Rios here. Mark, thanks for joining us. Thank you, my like, man. Super excited about our conversation yeah. today. So Mark, uh, <laughs> let me just do a quick intro. Um, so Mark is a 30 year entertainment industry veteran who turned his passion for real estate into his profession which is pretty exciting, excited to hear about that today. Uh, he's currently the co-founder of Prosperity CRE, a boutique private equity real estate company, focusing on acquiring large value add multifamily properties in various markets across the country. It's pretty cool. Having completed his master's degree in commercial real estate finance, Mark is also working on scaling a large digital marketing company as a family business. Good to have you, Mark. Thanks, man. Thanks awesome. for having me. I got to tell you, just from the outset, you told me that we're going to meet down at a cigar shop. I know I can't buy any Cubans, shh, but I brought my Cuban jacket uh, just so that uh, everybody can see it right here. Viva Cuba Libre. And, uh, you know, I'll at least be thinking about Cubans in spirit, hanging absolutely. out with Che right above. Yeah, <laughs> you'll be having some cigars with us today. That's right, baby. What are you smoking over there? So I got a, uh, I got a Monte Cristo. Nice. And this is the classic series, nice and uh, nice and easy because yeah. uh, I haven't smoked in a while. And um, nice and smooth. If I start to turn green in the gills, you know, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have some scotch later, right? Cool. Well, I'm having a David off. Should be pretty good. Yeah. All right. Let's let's get let's get right into it. So what are we doing here? So how did you get into real estate development? What was the uh, what was your career path into it? What did you do before and what kind of triggered you to get into it? I actually started out pretty young. I didn't know I was going to be in real estate. I was, uh, I, so I, I used to like to take these, I'm, I grew up in California. I used to like to take these drives throughout California. And one of the drives I used to take all the time was um, up through Tehachapi. And there's this little road that goes from the, the Tehachapi Pass up into uh, Lake Isabella. And so one time I was with a, an ex-girlfriend of mine. We was she your ex on the drive or? No, after, Derek, I was with her. After the drive, you guys were. On the yeah. drive, we were together. And um, we were going through this, you know, like California's amazing. So we were going through this area that was just all rural, a lot of um, ranches and farmland, just a little back road. Yeah. And I saw a sign that said 35 acres for sale, owner financing or something like that. So I went into the, the real estate office, told this guy, I'm very interesting, show us you know, what you have. And he showed us a couple of five acre pieces of land, 35 grand, like what, 7,000 an acre. And uh, I saw this one spot that was like, it had a little road, it was up on a hill. The, everything was pretty much cleared. It had like one oak tree, I think on, on the property. And, um, and then there was a little pad. And like, I've just, my eyes just lit up. And I'm like, how do I get into this? He's like, give me $2,500 down. The lady will carry it, $350 a month. You know, if you don't pay it, then, you know, you can just give the deed back and we're good. And little did I know that that was like one of the best creative financing techniques that you could ever find in real estate because there's no, you know, there's no qualifications. And um, at least as an owner, if you're giving owner financing that way, it's a really you know, the way that they set it up, you could easily just quick claim the deed right back to you and no harm, no foul. You know, you made some payments, maybe you made the down payment and- uh, So you actually did do it? I did, I bought it. Uh, my grandfather gave me the 2,500 bucks. I had these dreams of uh, starting a Christmas tree farm. 
mm. up there. And so, of course, I'm an entrepreneur, yeah. even at that age. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to, how to start. <laughs> that was like 19. Hey, there was, a, there was a shortage of trees the last couple of years. I don't know, but I had this whole thing. Like people could show up and they can, you know, if I grow some trees, they can come and chop down their own tree and the whole bit, you know. Do you still have that property or no? No, I lost it. You lost it, huh? Good lessons learned there, I'm sure, right? I was 19, you know, as an actor, uh -huh. had no money. Even three, 350 bucks a month, like that was a lot. Yeah. That was my rent, I think, at that point. And um, I held on to it. We went camping, you know, me and my friends, we did a couple camping trips up there. Loved it, you know, but then I had to give it back. Yeah, that, that's what launched the real estate career, huh? Definitely. So that was owner financing. Yeah. So you're heavily into the, the capital side. What are some other uh, financing methods in development? So for development, you know, oh gosh, listen, when you're, you're doing any kind of real estate, especially commercial real estate or a development where, you know, you're dealing with high finance. Obviously the main component is you got to figure out who's going to lend you the, the biggest chunk of money. Is it going to be a bank? Is it going to be a private investor? You know, is it going to be you're funding it through partners? Maybe you're funding it with somebody else. Like what's that base chunk going to be? The bottom 30, 50 percent, right? And then beyond that, you know, then you start filling in the gaps to, um, uh, to, to, to get the rest of the money, whether it's for the down payment, whether it's for what we call CapEx or the, you know, the capital costs, construction costs, things like that, that are on top so of- So your first deal was your grandfather gave you the loan, right? So family loan. No, actually that, that first chunk was the owner. She gave me, she gave me a senior loan, like first, you know, first loan. And then my grandfather gave me the down payment. So she gave you the loan with capital she already had. She owned the land outright. She just said, I'll, I'll give you the loan. She created a note I see. and I was just making payments. I see. What I, was, what was the, did she give you like a rate? I had, I think it was somewhere above 8% probably. I see. I see. It was amortized over a long period of time. The great thing about like finance and, and notes, you can adjust one thing in order to have an outcome. So if, if we, you and I are talking, you know, like I want to buy this car or I want to buy this piece of property or whatever, the first thing that I want to figure out is what are you more sensitive to? Are you sensitive to payments? Like what, what or do you, or are you more sensitive to the total cost of the land? Mm -hmm. To me, it was the payments. I wanted as little payment as possible. So she set up something where it was like, okay, well then we won't do, you know, a, a five-year note. We're going to do a 30-year note in order to get the, the payment down, but you're going to be on the hook for 30 years, paying 30, 350 a month, what, you know? Was she eager to get the land sold? I don't know. What was the driving force for I her? I actually, I think this is what she did. I, I see. Think I think that she owned a few pieces of land. I see. And she wasn't doing anything with it. She's like, okay, let's sell on the owner financing. Mm. And if somebody fails, I'll just take it back. Oh, wow. I find from my experience that the owners feel like their their land or their assets are worth more than what the market value is, mm -hmm. right? And also, obviously it depends on where the economy is, right? Yeah. What's the seller's, buyer's market, it just yeah. depends. But what other types of creative financing do you guys use? Right now we're like with my company, Prosperity CRE, we're very straight down the middle in terms of, of how, we, um, how we put together the initial financing. So we use agency debt, we use Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you know, stuff that's gonna be bonded up. We get creative when we raise capital from investors. So when we're thinking about development, one of the things that we've been really exploring right now, aside from, from money from our investors, because the money from our investors is expensive, right? We might be able to get 6% debt on, on the initial piece from Freddie right. and Fannie, but then our investors, we have to pay them 13, 14, 15, you know, percent or higher. Mm -hmm. So how do we find cheaper debt and to try to take away some of that more expensive money. Mm -hmm. And so there's a thing that's out there right now called C-PACE financing. I forget the, what the acronym means, but it's, um, it's a type of financing that will fill in the gaps where it allows you to pay for capital things like your HVAC, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe some roofs or, you know, big ticket yeah. items. 
And instead of it being a loan that is secured by a trust deed, like a, like a bank loan, it's, it's actually secured with the property taxes. And whenever you pay your property okay. taxes, you're paying, you know, you pay a chunk of that, that payment, right? And if something happens, you know, they're not going to foreclose on the property. It runs with the land until that property is paid off. Got it. It's a very okay. innovative kind of way of financing. It doesn't work for all, all properties, but for development, redevelopment, value, heavy value add kind of stuff where you have, you have yeah. big things you have to pay for and you don't have the money for it. Yeah. C-Pace is something that's coming on really, really strong and right now. Is that product available from like major mainstream banks or is that like a, yeah. where do you find that? Yeah. So, um, actually it's a good question. Um, I don't, I, I feel like I've heard of some big players doing it, but it's not, it's not a product that you're going to get like a regular senior loan. You know, it might be a company that a big bank had purchased and they just have that financing company or they're funding, you know, their table, I see. table funding it. I see. Yeah. It's not like hard money though. No, 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 no. It's different. Hard money is very mercenary. That's mercenary money, right? Right. You're going to get a, you're going to get a trust deed because that's the safest, um, that's the safest kind of security you can get in a property. Yeah. Right. They're going to try to get a first trust deed. Right. Sometimes they'll do seconds, but you're going to you're going to pay for it. And they're only going to do up to a certain loan to value, you know. Yeah. And if you want more, they're, they're going to say, well, what other properties do you have? We'll securitize those. So now you have you have to put your, you know, your house up as collateral or your second house or your kids, you know, your kids BMW or whatever. <laughs> No. Or the kid itself, you know, right? your kid. You put your kid up. Yeah. Collateral. collateral. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. Number four. If I can get a trustee yeah. on my kid, forget it. <laughs> His future earnings. <laughs> totally. Right. So, um, so, so, owner financing within the owner financing sphere, there's ways of like lease to own is a really creative. I'm talking about single family houses, duplexes, stuff like that. Lease to own is a very creative way to to do owner financing. And then after a period of time, um, be able to uh, purchase the property, right? Without having to qualify in the same way I as see. a bank. That's pretty know? interesting. Yeah. So there, there are different products out there that you guys are using. Are, what, what's the majority of type of assets you guys are looking at right now? So right now we're, we're strictly multifamily. Mm -hmm. We have background in, you know, industrial, flex, properties, a little bit of office, but mainly it's multifamily. And, and within the multifamily space where we are um, pretty strictly in the garden style multifamily. So garden style is the large apartment buildings, hundred units plus, mm -hmm. usually with a lot of trees, big parking lots. Um, you'll see they're like broken up by buildings that are maybe two, three stories tall not elevators. Okay. They have breezeways, okay. you know, exterior doors, some balconies, things like that. So no elevators because no elevators. of the infrastructure or Yeah. The, the, yeah. Typically it adds a it adds a it adds a um a component to the type of property where you don't necessarily need it if you have space. What areas do you see out in, in the US that are you think are have high potential? Um, I don't know if that's like confidential or not, but like what, what markets are out there that you think has still have room for growth? Yeah. Cause we're filming this. This is the end of the end of the year, uh, 2023, obviously the real estate market's kind of changing a lot. What, what markets do you see out there that are going to be still good, like opportunities? Yeah. We really, really love the Midwest and there's probably five or six markets that we, we just love Kansas city bar none. It's probably one of the best markets that we've, you know, just in terms of growth, uh, in terms of diversity of economy, yeah. um, in terms of where jobs yeah. generally are. Um, we love Indianapolis, fantastic market. We love um, marginally St. Louis, but we like St. Louis more for commercial stuff. So anywhere that has an NFL team. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could, you could say that. <laughs> well, no, there's not one in St. Louis anymore. Yeah, the Rams gonna, moved yeah, back yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a great yeah, you know, yeah. baseball team, but okay. like, and in the Ohio, uh, Ohio. So Columbus, Ohio is a fantastic market. Market in Cincinnati is a great market. Then down in the Sun Belt, right now, um, we're actually, as as we're filming, we are um, under contract on a deal in Greensboro, which is, um, it's probably about seventy miles outside of Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill. 
So yeah, we, we love the Sun Belt too, you know, down there. Atlanta, of course, is a fantastic market if you can, yeah. you know, you can buy. How, how much of your time are you spending actually at those locations looking for properties? So what we do is when we find a new market that we like, we generally try to take a, like a reconnaissance trip, just even without even looking at deals. Sometimes that's not possible. So we will, um, we'll generally, f like if we are chasing a deal, we'll fly in, we'll do a site visit, and then we'll also see other properties um, that are out there that might be coming up on our radar. We drive the markets. Before that, we'll have already, you know, spoken to a few property managers, uh -huh. spoken to the brokers. If we know anybody locally there, spoken to them uh -huh. to figure out where the paths of progress are, where things are right. happening, right. where people are moving. You know, garden style uh, apartments are generally, they're generally like suburban type of properties. And so you're out where, where's the retail at? Where's the best buy going in? No, I hear you. As you say that, it kind of triggers some things in my, my brain. Like in this market, in specifically in Southern California, the demand for housing is still there. It's just, how are you going to provide it? Right. Obviously rates have gone up. Uh, cash is not as readily or i should say capital is not as readily available partially because of the rates but the demand is still there right and you see a lot of apartments going up but those have been in the in the queue for years absolutely right that's that's right it. how are we going to hit that demand because it's still there and that kind of leads me into the the topic about um like what opportunities outside of just ground up build outs are there that you're looking at like conversions or what do yeah. you see coming up that could help? I think, you know, I think one of the most exciting, in the housing market, one of the most exciting things is the possibility of conversion. The problem that I see is the pandemic really exposed a lot of things. And what we saw with office buildings is we have a lot of really old office product that is functionally obsolete. Right, you have stuff that was built in the late 70s, 80s, even 90s, that now, in order to make it attractive to the new realities of, of office, you know, you got hybrid workers yeah. and you gotta give them a new coffee clutch in the corner and a yoga studio. And like, in order to, to, to do that, would require massive amounts of money just on these little crappy office buildings. You know, that are sitting over here in the corner, things like that. Unless it's just, you know, like you just build it out and you want to just lower your rates and, and yeah. just have some little office that, you know, the neighborhood attorney like takes over. But I'm talking, you know, on a, on a scale that's sustainable. So then when you, you start thinking, well, what can I convert this to? And we, we talked about yeah. this before. Like, can we convert this to medical office? Yeah. Can we, we, we actually were looking at a deal. We weren't really chasing it, but looking at yeah. a deal that you just said was turned into senior housing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because the stuff that we looked at when we were looking at that property, we would have had to retrofit the floors, yeah. the elevators widen, you know, and all of that was like, it turned, you know, $600 a square foot you know, purchase because we had to buy at a low basis to, you know, with, with to, you know, 1500 bucks a square foot just yeah. to do anything. Right. Right. And so that's even worse when you have older buildings and then yeah. you think about, well, okay, I got this, you know, functionally absolute thing. Can I even turn it into housing or medical office or, yeah. and it's, an, there's a lot of challenges in that. Or do you just, you know, raise the buildings and build new? Yeah you know, and, and start all over. So value add, you guys do the value add, but that's more of like cosmetic upgrades. Yeah, we, we can get deep pretty, yeah. but it's usually, it's usually upgrades that are going to push rents. What are the key factors that push rent? The key factors that push rent are interior renovations. So, you know, your kitchens, your bathrooms, bar none, and then how many bedrooms, right? Typically, flooring is really important. So carpeting, if you can do hardwood flooring in most of the, the house, what mm -hmm. we call wet areas, so the bathrooms and the kitchen at least, mm -hmm. and then maybe premium carpet in the, in the either living room or the bedrooms, mm -hmm. um, that's very, very good. So those, those typically can drive rents. Appliances, stainless steel appliances, you know, that's what people look for now, you know. 
those allow you to be able to charge a little bit more than somebody who hasn't done that yet. Yeah. Uh, and then curb appeal stuff, right? If you were, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have a modern kind of, you know, twist to it. But if you have upgraded signage, you know, the parking lot looks yeah. clean, the, the landscaping looks clean, all of that stuff will help drive rents as well. Places that people would just want to go home and live in that are located in decent areas that are that are low in crime, right? It doesn't have rent control, right? Well, for us, you know, yeah. we don't... That's a big prohibitor, yeah. I mean, you know, we just talked about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a unit. How do I get that money back in a rent control situation? Yeah. How do I put in $12,000 a unit and get that back in a rent control situation? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, we, we're, we were just, I had a meeting, I think it was last week or the, it was the week before with a prefab company that does basically prefab modular residential mm -hmm. and they plug that into office space. I love that. Right. And it's produced here in the U.S. The, the challenge is getting the infrastructure and the, the layout of the building and getting these prefab units to fit, right? It's like almost like Legos, but then you have like a, a box trying to fit in a circle, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the biggest challenge. What When you're looking at prefab stuff, what is the, um, what do you have to have in place in order to get a pre? Do you have to have the foundation yeah. poured and basically all of your utilities ready to go yeah. and they just come and drop the walls in or how does yeah. that work? So the prefab stuff, the way it works is obviously it's, pre-manufactured right so it's basically cookie cutter stuff right they try to customize like the finishes and stuff but mm -hmm. for it to add value be cost effective and fast it's pre-fabricated and it has a certain plugs into a certain place that place it plugs into if, if it's an office building typical office buildings are usually like rectangle right or mm -hmm. square mm -hmm. right and there's in the core is the elevator right bank mm -hmm. so in that building that you got to upgrade the infrastructure so you got to run power or mechanical or plumbing. You got to run it to that prefab unit. Mm -hmm. And from the unit, you just plug it in. And then the unit itself is uh, runs itself. Hmm. Is the prefab now, part of it, is it an add-on to existing buildings? Is that what it is? or is It's it, an add-on to the interior. To the interior. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's like uh, putting a, a, a pre prefabricated house or an apartment inside an office building, right? Huh. In office spaces, they usually have high decks, right? Mm -hmm. floor, floor to ceiling clearances. Yeah. So there's a lot of good opportunity That's there. That's interesting. And and from what I understand, in Canada, it's subsidized. Hmm. So I think the U. S. There was just an article that just came out that um, I believe the federal government is going to look into subsidizing, right? Because there's a housing shortage, right? Yeah. There's affordability issues, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I think it's it's gonna happen. It's happening. It's just getting it to pencil out. 